At 2 p.m. on October 6th, 1973, in the Jewish calendar, the 10th day of Tishrei, the day that marks the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur, a coordinated surprise attack was launched on the State of Israel by its two great adversaries, Egypt in the south and Syria in the north. In the south, a massive Egyptian army of over 100,000 men, 1,400 tanks, 2,000 guns and mortars swarmed over the Suez Canal and overran the lightly manned Israeli fortifications and advanced into the Sinai Peninsula. In the north, most of the Golan Heights fell to the advancing Syrian army comprised of 30,000 men, 800 tanks, plus a contingency of paratroopers forcing Israeli withdrawals from many positions. The Yom Kippur War, the bloodiest war and the most consequential war in Israeli history since its founding, had begun. During the first few days of the war, Israel absorbed devastating blows as Egypt and Syria secured victories in the Sinai and in the Golan. Initially, Israel tried to counterattack in the south. They launched an attack two days into the war, but it largely failed. In the north, Israel managed to successfully repel and repulse the Syrians back to the pre-war ceasefire lines four days into the war on October 9th. And then they proceeded to launch an offensive deep into Syria, and ultimately that brought them to within 20 miles of Damascus. With Syria on the defensive, Israel was able to concentrate its forces in the Sinai, and they undertook a second counterattack, wherein Israeli forces managed to cross over the Suez Canal and establish a beachhead on its eastern banks, and eventually they trapped and encircled the Egyptian Third Army. Despite the early setbacks in the war and the terrifyingly high number of fatalities, an Israeli military victory was eventually secured, but it led to no immediate diplomatic or strategic triumph, and it plunged the nation into a state of gloom. The Yom Kippur War fundamentally altered the landscape of the Middle East until today. Unlike the Six-Day War that radically reshaped Israel's borders on the map, the changes spawned by the Yom Kippur War, they would not be manifested cartographically, but the shifts were no less consequential, not for Israel, nor for its neighbors. This is the first of four episodes on the Yom Kippur War. The subject of this episode is the surprise attack that kick-started this conflict. The first day of the Yom Kippur War saw more Israeli casualties than the entirety of the Six-Day War on all three fronts. And the obvious questions that we have to ask is, you know, how were the Israelis so unprepared for this devastating attack? Why didn't they mobilize their civilian army in time to stunt the initial enemy advances? Why didn't Israel take the initiative like they did in the Six-Day War and launch a preemptive attack? And even from the Syrian and Egyptian perspectives, you know, why would they initiate a war that by all accounts, and even certainly from the Egyptian side, even from the enemy's accounts, it seemed very unlikely that they could ever actually win. So I think to understand the Yom Kippur War in context, we first have to kind of study the events and the developments in the intervening years between the Six-Day War in 1967 and the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Of course, in June of 1967, Israel won a decisive victory in the Six-Day War. They successfully conquered Gaza and the entire Sinai Peninsula from Egypt. They managed to secure the old city of Jerusalem and the West Bank from the Jordanians and the strategically vital Golan Heights from the Syrians. And this really changed the dynamics in Israel. With the conquest of the Golan, there's now a buffer between the vulnerable Israeli villages and the Syrian artillery that would constantly pound them 
prior to the Six Day War, a modicum of tranquility was available to Israeli citizens in the north. With the conquest of the West Bank, Israel was no longer a mere 10 miles in her narrowest point. Tel Aviv was no longer within range of Jordanian artillery. And the prospect of a Jordanian attack now from the other side of the Jordan River was exceedingly unlikely. In order to actually attack an Israeli population center, the Jordanians would have to traverse a very large and very mountainous, unpopulated area in order to reach the Israeli heartland. In the south, with the conquest of the Sinai, the most dangerous enemy, the of course the Egyptians, they were now at bay. A vast desert would need to be traversed before they could attack any major Israeli population center. As an example, before the Six Day War, Israel would have between three and four minutes of notification, of warning prior to an Egyptian aerial attack. Now, thanks to the Sinai buffer, they have 16 minutes. It seems like it's an eternity to prepare for any Egyptian aerial attack. In effect, the Six Day War succeeded in quadrupling the area of land controlled by Israel, but it probably amplified their collective national sense of invincibility by at least that much. They finally had some breathing room. It seemed to all, or at least to many, that the wars with her Arab nations were over. Quiet was secured. The existential anxiety that had accompanied Israel in her first 19 years of existence, it's relieved. Peace was anticipated by many in Israel, peace out of strength, peace as victors, and maybe even lasting peace with Israel's Arab neighbors was anticipated by the Israeli public and by its leadership. Sadly, peace would have to wait for many, many years. A week after the Six-Day War, the Israeli cabinet convened, and they voted unanimously to forfeit much of the territorial acquisitions in exchange for peace. They give Egypt back the entire Sinai. They give them back Gaza if they even wanted it, provided a peace deal could be arranged. They'd return the Golan Heights if it was demilitarized to Syria There was never much of a discussion to return Jerusalem, the West Bank, to the Jordanians. They probably didn't even want it. But Israel was at least opened to negotiations with King Hussein of Jordan regarding Israel's eastern border. Israel was open. It was eager for peace. But the Arabs, and especially the de facto leader of the Arab world, the immensely prideful Egyptian president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, They were loath to engage in direct peace talks with Israel. Arab policy towards Israel was codified in Khartoum in the Arab summit a few months after the Six-Day War. At the summit, attended by the heads of the most significant Arab states, they all agreed to the famous three no's, no recognition of Israel, no negotiation with Israel, and no peace with Israel. Egyptian President Nasser He would often declare with his trademark flair, land that was lost by force will be reclaimed by force. The problem is, how do you do it? Israel's position was quite dominant. So Nasser developed a multi-pronged plan to reconquer the lost territory. So the first part of the plan which became known as the War of Attrition, it called for ongoing, incessant, small-scale attacks on Israeli positions. Yes, Israel got the Sinai. Yes, their forces were all the way up to the eastern banks of the Suez Canal. But let's not let them enjoy it for even a second. In addition, this kind of war, the War of Attrition, that essentially began right after the Six-Day War, three weeks later, the first provocation from the Egyptians began. This war would be a different kind of war. Everyone realized that the Six-Day War 
was won by Israel because it was a very dynamic war. Speed, maneuverability, that was key. What happens when you translate that into a static war of attrition? Speed and maneuverability no longer have much value. Now it's about artillery. It's about manpower. It's about resilience. It's about how long can you stay in a conflict without losing the public support. Well, in that area, Egypt would be able to outmatch her Israeli counterparts. And the theory was, this is something that the Egyptians understood very well, they realized that the Israeli public had a very low tolerance of loss of forces compared to the Egyptians. You know, even today when there's exchanges, they want, you know, the bones of two Israeli soldiers in exchange for a thousand terrorists. And that's because there's an asymmetric value on life that is ascribed to the Israeli soldiers versus the Egyptian, but all other Arab uh, forces as well. So he realized if there's this unrelenting attack against Israeli troops, that's going to inflict a tremendous blow to the Israelis' civilian and military forces to their morale. In addition, it's going to inflict heavy economic burden and it's going to destroy a lot of the weaponry and material of the of the Israelis. And his hope was, after this prolonged, protracted war of attrition, it may create the conditions either to facilitate a full-scale crossing of the canal, an initiation of a much bigger war, or maybe it would force Israel's hand into negotiations and concessions, allowing Egypt to reclaim her lost territory. In addition, the fact that there was ongoing fighting, well, that would maintain the issue of the Israeli occupation, so to speak, of the Sinai. It would maintain it on the international scene and will help keep the diplomatic pressure on Israel. Now, this three-year war from 1967 to 1970, when a ceasefire was signed, it wasn't exactly waged in conventional terms. In fact, even in Israel, they didn't recognize it as an official Israeli war until recently. There's no full-scale campaigns. There's no continuous battles. There's no change in the front lines. But it's just characterized by small-scale attacks, followed by Israeli reprisals, various escalations and lulls. Israel's billing fortifications along the lines. Egypt is sniping at them. Various bombardments from both sides. Raids, many, many raids into the opposing enemy territory. Egyptian commandos try to infiltrate the Sinai. Israeli units penetrating Egyptian territory. There's sporadic naval battles. There's hundreds of dogfights in the air. And of course, Egypt is continuously increasing their troop presence along the Suez. Now, this war ultimately led to nearly a 1,000 Israeli casualties, even more than the Six-Day War. So that's the first part of his plan, the War of Attrition. Another central component of Nasser's plan was, of course, rearmament. Before any full-scale war can be launched against Israel, Egypt had to replenish, to resupply its depleted power. Remember, during the Six-Day War, virtually its entire air force and much of its armor, both, of course, supplied by the generous Soviets, were decimated by Israeli strikes. And the Soviets, of course, were eager to oblige and they replenished them with stronger, more modern equipment. So out go the mid-17s and mid-19s, and now Egypt's been outfitted with the more modern, the next generation, mid-21s. The tanks, the T-34s, are replaced with the more powerful T-54s and T-55s. But in addition, the Soviets also supplied the Egyptians with initially hundreds, but eventually thousands of Russian military advisors. And the plan was to not only upgrade the weaponry of the Egyptians, but to upgrade their tactics, to upgrade their strategies, to use the the most cutting-edge Soviet military plans to implement them in the Egyptian fighting forces and eventually even to aid in operations. 
Nasser at one point even proposed taking a Soviet Air Force general and appointing him to assume command of the Egyptian Air Force. But of course, the Russians reject that. It would be too thorny from a geopolitical perspective. Within a year after the Six-Day War, Egypt had not only regained its military strength lost in that conflict, now thanks to the new and improved weapons, its strength was enhanced. Just an example of some of the new military technology that is showcased during the War of Attrition, but eventually a big part of the Yom Kippur War. So in October of 1967, so four months after the Six-Day War, an Israeli warship, a destroyer called a lot, was previously a British World War II era ship. It's been bought by Israel. So this ship is patrolling in the Mediterranean in international waters. It's 14 nautical miles off the coast of Port Said. This is in the northern part of the Suez Canal. And it's struck by three Soviet-made surface-to-surface Styx missiles. It was launched, these missiles were launched from an Egyptian missile boat, and eventually the Israeli ship is sunk, 47 dead, and 90 injured. The problem was, is that this crew had not noticed any enemy ship in its radar. And the reason why is because the attacking ship was anchored in the Port Said Harbor at the northern tip of the Suez Canal. And this event, to modern ears, doesn't sound so novel, but at the time, it attracted worldwide attention because this was the first time in history that a warship was sunk by a surface-to-surface missile. So this inaugurated a new era in development of naval weapons but also in formulation of naval battle strategy around the world. And this foreshadowed the naval missile battles between the Israelis and the Egyptians and the Syrian navies during the Yom Kippur War. So in retaliation for the sinking of the Eilat, the Israelis chose not to attack Port Said, which is in the northern part of the canal, but to concentrate its attack on the Port Suez, which is at the southern part of the canal, And four days afterwards, Israel launched a heavy concentration of artillery fire on the Egyptian oil refineries in Suez and essentially destroyed most of the plants that produce Egypt's oil. So what do we have over here? We have these escalations and these attacks and these reprisals, which almost always invariably led to a certain calm. So this retaliation leads to a calm period that lasts until the summer of 1967, when once again things flare up. At the time, Egypt has 150,000 troops stationed on the West Bank of the Suez, over a 1,000 artillery pieces, all kinds of mortar and tank weaponry, and they initiate a highly concentrated barrage of attacks on Israeli positions alongside the canal, resulting in 10 dead and 18 wounded. Now, this artillery exchange is considered to be the official beginning of the war of attrition, and it caused the Israelis to rethink their strategy along the canal and to initiate the defense that became known as the Bar-Lev line. Now, in response for this provocation, in October of 68, Israeli helicopters carrying a team of Seret Matkal commandos, they penetrated deep into Egyptian territory and they destroyed all kinds of Egyptian infrastructure, caused blackouts all over the country, destroyed a dam, destroyed multiple bridges. And this, in effect, exposed the Egyptian vulnerabilities. You know, Israel was vulnerable to artillery attacks, but Egypt was vulnerable to aerial attacks and to invasions and to raids. You know, it, Israel is showing a capability of penetrating territory that's hundreds of miles away from the nearest Israeli-held land. So as this fighting, this back-and-forth fighting is going along, Israel decides to reinforce its position on the east bank of the Suez Canal by constructing fortifications to protect its troops 
from bombardments and also to create a defensive line to hold any Egyptian advancement. Now, it's important for us to remember the Suez Canal, it's 100 miles long. And you have Egyptian troops situated its entire length. And you know that at some point in the near-term future, it's actually one is a big uncertainty, but there's going to be a crossing attempt. Egypt is dead set on reclaiming its lost territory. So they're going to cross the canal at some point. Where are they going to cross? You have, of course, the canal. It's about 200 yards wide. Moshe Dayan famously called it the world's best anti-tank ditch. But there's an understanding that they're going to cross. So the Israeli military establishment, they sat down to figure out, okay, how are we going to build a defensive fortification along the canal? Do we build it straddling the canal? Do we build it a few miles inland? Do we build it at the places where we expect the Egyptian crossing to happen? Do we build it along the entirety of the canal? And of course, there's pros and cons to each one of these arguments. You put the line right along the the water. Well, not only do you have a defensive line right at the border that seems to stop any sort of crossing, but you also have observation points. You see what's happening in the enemy territory. So eventually, what they decide was to build what became known as the Barlev Line named after the Israeli chief of staff, Chaim Barlev. This became the largest engineering project in Israeli history. It costed north of $300 million, which is not so much today's dollars, but was a pretty significant sum at the time. And in effect, there's many components of this front. Number one, this line is incorporating a massive continuous sand wall lining the entire canal. They build these sand embankments between 60 to 80 feet high alongside the entirety of the canal, reinforced by a concrete wall and backed up by anti-tank ditches. So the argument was, you know, if Egypt's ever going to cross the canal, they're going to have to lay down bridges to cross tanks and other units, well, in order to build a bridge, they're going to need to knock down this sand wall. And that, according to Israeli estimates, would take a minimum of 24 hours, giving the Israelis ample time to mobilize and to respond. It's important to remember, Egypt has one of the largest standing armies in the world. And the Israeli army while it does have a pretty robust standing army given its population, given its size, in any war, the plan is, of course, to call up the reserves, and therefore time is of essence. You build this massive sand wall, you get a, a little bit of, of time, a little bit of breathing room when you know that the Egyptians are initiating a wall, you have time to call up your troops. This huge sand wall has an added benefit that it kind of obstructed the Egyptians' view of the building of the fortifications. We could do what we want over here without them noticing. Now, behind this sand wall, they built an elaborate network of 26 different fortifications, fortifications that could withstand the heaviest of bombardments. In fact, these fortifications were able to withstand a bomb up to 500 kilograms in size. Moreover, these fortifications could be used to launch counterattacks against Egyptian artillery. Beyond the fortifications, well, their defensive positions for tank and artillery units, and they're connected with a series of roads patrolled by mobile units and, of course, tanks and artillery. And the hope was that these fortifications would be able to operate in unison provide each other with mutual support, and could amplify the relative power by working together. In addition to deter an Egyptian crossing, the the Israelis installed an underwater pipe system that could electronically and remotely pump and ignite a thin film 
of flammable crude oil into the Suez Canal. So you would sit in the fortification, push some buttons, and you could ignite the entire or at least certain parts of this canal, turn it into a moat of fire, and thereby thwarting an Egyptian attempted crossing. This had a psychological component as well because they installed some of these systems, but then they installed some of the dummies, dummy systems. And that would have a very strong psychological effect on the Egyptians and make them more wary of a crossing. So that was the plan with the Bar Lev line. It's going to provide a warning system in the event of an Egyptian attempt at crossing. It would provide a defensive wall to prevent an Egyptian beachhead on the eastern bank of the Suez, and it would slow an Egyptian advance and thereby limit or mitigate the potential number of casualties in the event of an invasion. Now, during the actual Yom Kippur War, and certainly during the initial stages of the war, the Bar Lev line would fail catastrophically. Instead of taking 24 hours for those sand walls to be removed, they were removed by pumps. They were pumping water. They tried to explode it. They realized it's much simpler to just use water. And within hours, two hours at most, they built huge breaches into the walls, removing them big enough for tanks to go through. And all of the fortifications, with the exception of one, all of them were captured and or bypassed by the initial Egyptian advance. Instead of these separate fortifications operating as one, they were each operated independently as this small stronghold trying to fight on its own against a massive Egyptian advance. This clever plan to turn the canal into a river of fire, of course, was impractical from the beginning. You know, they had the canal and the canal is moving. There's a current. So it caused the system to be clogged with sand, with silt. And by the time the Kippur War arrived, they were rusting completely inoperational. Regardless, on the eve of the war, teams of Egyptian frogmen actually blocked the underwater openings with concrete. Now, it's important to stress that several Israeli generals, notably Ariel Sharon and Israel Tal, they vehemently objected to the Bar Lev line. They argued that it would not succeed in fending off Egyptian attackers. Sharon instead, he was in favor of manning the canal with more agile mobile units stationed a few miles off the canal, and then they would have the ability to, to be repositioned, to be repurposed, to be redeployed as the needs warranted. But ultimately, he was overridden by the chief of staff, by Chaim Bar Lev, and they opted for these fixed fortification. During the Six-Day War, and really throughout uh, Israeli military history prior, the doctrine of, of Israel was always having speed, maneuverability, mobility of movement. And now they opted for a static line of defense with catastrophic uh, results. You can only wonder what would have happened if the Israelis would have been prepared to repulse the initial Egyptian onslaught, what would have happened if their layout, if the defensive layout of the plan was different? Now, it's also important to note that the fact that Israel is investing hundreds of millions of dollars building these permanent fortifications right on the Suez Canal, that wrinkled the Egyptians because it implied that the Israelis would never leave. You know, the Israelis professed to be willing to exchange the Sinai back for peace. And here they are building these massive fortifications. It seems like they're entrenching themselves for good. So that did not lead to a quieting of the artillery bombardments, rather to an escalation. So ironically, the Bar Lev line built to reduce Israeli casualties may have indirectly caused uh, many more Israeli and Jewish dead. In March of 1969, several Egyptian jets entered Israeli airspace. They're on a reconnaissance mission and they're shot down. So Egypt responds with striking the Bar Lev line and Israel retaliates with raids deep into Egyptian territory. 
causing tremendous damage. And this back and forth fighting continues almost uninterrupted for more than a year. If you were an Israeli soldier and you're leaving your post, you're leaving for vacation, you know you're vulnerable. They're taking pot shots at any sign of movement. Commando raids back and forth. Israel's destroying dams and bridges deep in the Egyptian heartland. Egypt is laying mines and mounting ambushes on patrols. It's a very hostile area of conflict. Uh, there's one operation that kind of jumps out when you're reading about this period, and that's the operation was called Bulmos Number 6. This is considered to be one of the most difficult and daring operations in Israeli history. A team of commandos from Shayet et Shloshesre, which is essentially the Navy commandos, the equivalent of the Navy SEALs, together with a team from Sayeret Matkal, Special Operations, they raided what's known as the Green Island, small artificial island fortress built by the British, actually, in the middle of the Gulf of Suez, a few miles south of the city of Suez. Again, this is on the southern tip of the Suez Canal. This fortress, it's of vital strategic importance because it was located at the mouth of the Suez Canal and it was laid in with anti-aircraft guns and radar equipment. And the Israelis decided to attack it and to create a seam through which they could mount aerial assaults on the enemy territory. So there's a short, very intense, very dramatic, very bold operation where the Israelis storm this fortress and essentially kill or capture everyone there, destroy the entire thing, and just leave. And I don't want to go through the entirety of it, but I'd advise everyone to go read the Wikipedia page. It's called Operation Bull Moose 6 or Green Island Raid. An incredibly stunning, daring, multi-layered operation. So again, we have this intensification on both sides. And it escalated yet further when the Israelis made a strategic decision. They decided instead of responding to Egyptian artillery with our artillery, we're going to mount air retaliation. And what they called it is there's ground artillery, we're going to use flying artillery. So for example, Egypt starts to bombard Israeli positions. Israel launches a massive aerial attack along all parts of the canal but focusing primarily on the artillery emplacements and on the surface-to-air aircraft guns. So you have this unmitigated success. The Israelis are, are flying over a thousand sorties, and they succeed in destroying a tremendous amount of the Egyptian infrastructure on the west bank of the Suez. They destroy anti-aircraft, they destroy tanks, they destroy artillery, they shoot down many Egyptian planes, they kill hundreds of, of Egyptian soldiers, and the Israeli losses are, are two planes. And essentially, for the rest of the war of attrition, Israel is dominating the air. They're launching many raids into Egyptian territory. They're conducting countless aerial bombardments on Egyptian defensive positions. They're destroying Egyptian ammunition depots. They're decimating military headquarters and training facilities. They're downing scores of Egyptian planes. But it doesn't solve the problem. Egyptian artillery fire is maybe reduced a little bit. The shelling continues. But more broadly, especially with relation to the Yom Kippur War, the tactical success of these operations, it's kind of masking the vulnerability that Israel has vis-a-vis -vis the Egyptians with respect to ground artillery. One of the major missteps of the Israeli military establishments in the Yom Kippur War was the notion that we would maintain air superiority. If we have air dominance, that will guide our counterattack, and therefore we don't need to be so concerned. They hit us hard, we'll hit them five times as hard. But 
during the initial stages of the, of the Yom Kippur War, the Israeli air power was ineffective. And therefore, being that Israel didn't beef up their ground game, they were outmatched and they were exposed by their Egyptian counterparts. And this vulnerability that Israel had in the air, well, that's a result of, of these raids. They're conducting these raids deep into, into Egypt. The residents of Cairo are becoming accustomed to being routinely alerted by these air raid warnings. It's causing alarm in the Egyptian military brass. And the Soviets, they're not too thrilled watching Western-made planes running roughshod all over Egypt. And therefore, something has to change. So in 1970, in January, Nasser visits the USSR. And he appeals not only for more Soviet troops, but for the most advanced weaponry and especially the SAM-3 surface-to-air missile systems. These are the most advanced anti-aircraft systems that would mitigate Israeli air superiority. And the Soviets are delighted to respond. They increase their troop presence to 15,000. In fact, they even send pilots and other forces to engage with the Israelis. The Israelis are told by their superiors, if you see a plane piloted by a Russian, don't shoot it down. We don't want to cause World War III here. But now Egypt has been outfitted with a network of anti-aircraft weaponry. And they have the SAM-2, which is more the long-range missiles. They have the SAM-3, which is portable. They put them on the cha- uh, on the chassis of of trucks and move them wherever they need to be. And they're very effective against low-flying planes. And they create this this network, this wall, in effect, of anti-aircraft firepower. And this is going to be v- of vital importance to stifle the Israeli counterattack. Egypt is going to have the ability to repulse that with their Soviet-acquired anti-aircraft weaponry. Eventually, an American-brokered three-month ceasefire was reached. Everyone's surprised. Suddenly, Nasser is willing to end the conflict. It seems likely that he was fearful of an Israeli preemptive strike. Maybe he was also scared of American involvement. But Henry Kissinger suggested that in a deceptive plan, Nasser intended to use the cover of the ceasefire to plan for his next larger engagement. So they sign the ceasefire. They agree to 90 days of total quiet along the Suez region. And then what does Nasser do? In explicit violation of the terms of the ceasefire, he begins to reposition his missile network closer and closer to the canal. The United States, they're not interested in dealing with this. They're preoccupied with Vietnam. So they convince Golda Meir, just don't respond to this provocation, ignore it. Menachem Begin, on the other hand, he had been part of the government since before the Six-Day War. He resigned from the government saying, we cannot stand idly when Nasser is taking these very dangerous steps of bringing his anti-aircraft batteries closer to our territory. With the SAM missiles in place, Nasser begins to prepare for his next step. The next step of the grand plan, the crossing of the canal, now they have missile protection. It's time to launch an attack, to gain a beachhead, to gain a foothold, on the east bank of the Suez. But sadly for him, the Almighty had different plans. On September 28th, 1970, a month and a half after the three-month ceasefire was signed, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser, aged a young 52, suffered a heart attack and died and was succeeded by Vice President Anwar Sadat, war was delayed. The original three-month ceasefire remained in effect for three years, 
until the launching of the Yom Kippur War, but for the time being, seemingly all was quiet on the southern front. So now that there's a ceasefire in place, Egypt, they're doing their provocations. Israel is also taking some steps to prepare and to harden its defenses. So they take the southern command and they transfer it to General Ariel Sharon, of course, the legendary fighter. Thanks to the ceasefire, they're able to reconstruct parts of the Bar Lev line that were destroyed during the war. Sharon, of course, he was in favor of making the defensive line a little bit removed from the water. So he adds a second layer of defenses between five and seven miles behind the the war line, behind the canal. But now we have quiet. And due to this period of essentially complete quiet, there is a newfound sense of security in the Israeli world. They begin to lower their guard. They begin to reduce their vigilance. Now, Sadat, who's a very clever, very astute politician, he contributed to the Israeli sense of security. He seems to be, at least initially, quite sympathetic to peace talks with Israel. He seems to be departing from Nasser's policy of reaching out to the Soviets. He actually expels, he purges the Russians in 1972. He gets rid of many of the pro-Soviet Nasserist members of the government and the security forces. And along the Bar Lev line, the Israelis gradually loosen up and they settle into this false sense of security. Of the original 28 fortifications, 10 of them are deactivated. They're covered by sand. It's too expensive to maintain them. They wanted to reduce defense expenditures, and therefore they shuttered 10 of the 26 fortifications. The number of soldiers manning these fortifications were also reduced to the absolute minimum. But now over time, the exact role of this very formidable defense line It's becoming a little bit murky. It's a little bit opaque. Is it primarily a warning system? Well, if it's a warning system, it doesn't need to be very heavily manned. Is it supposed to be a defensive blockade to an enemy invasion? Well, then it's it's too lightly manned. In the end, it was kind of neither. You know, Israel builds these 80-foot sand embankments Now we could see over to the Egyptian side. The Egyptians respond with 130-foot sand embankments on their side. Instead of Israel observing her enemies and being able to make plans and movements unobserved, well, we have now the opposite. It's also way too lightly manned to stunt any Egyptian attack. When the Kippur War began and 100,000 Egyptian troops poured over the canal... The Barlev line was guarded by a grand total of 450 soldiers. And sadly, many of those soldiers would go on to perish in the early days of the war. And while Israel is lowering her guard, and while Israel's vigilance is being weakened, and while Israel's being lulled into this false sense of security, Sadat... And the Egyptians are quietly and deceptively preparing for war. And essentially for years, since 1971, the plans have been being formulated in absolute secrecy. Only the highest of the Egyptian military echelons, only they even knew of it. And the actual soldiers did not know of the attack until the day of a few hours prior to the attack. Now, one of the major problems that led to the catastrophe of the initial stages of the of the Yom Kippur War from the Israeli side was the horrific Israeli intelligence failure. How did they miss it? How did Israeli intelligence fail to detect these months of secret preparations and mobilizations in Egypt and in Syria? How were they completely surprised and unprepared? in terms of manpower, in terms of tanks, what happened? It's important to note that, of course, Israel observed 
everything. But the Israeli intelligence community, the Amman, which is the military intelligence, and the Mossad, they were guided by a multi-pronged strategic concept, it was in fact called Hakoncepsia, the concept, that essentially contributed to every decision they made, and that concept mandated that war was not happening no matter what you observed on the ground. Everyone knew that Egypt and Syria would try to wage war to recover lost territory. But the concept of the Israeli intelligence was certain, number one, that Syria would not go to war alone without Egypt, and that Egypt would only wage war in the event that the entire Sinai was recoverable. Israeli intelligence did not believe that Egypt would launch a war to get just purely a foothold and use that for negotiations. Thirdly, the Israeli concept understood that the Israeli advantage was most manifested, was most pronounced in the air. And in order for Egypt to be successful in any sort of campaign against Israel, they'd have to neutralize the Israeli air dominance. In the Six-Day War and in all the years that followed, the Egyptian pilots and jets were just no match for the Israeli Air Force, and therefore was accepted as an inarguable fact that Egypt would not wage war until it had the capacity to have some sort of parity with Israelis with respect to the air, and they would have the ability to strike Israeli airfields. And to do that, it would require they would have squadrons of bombers, MiG-23s, Egypt simply didn't have them. There were no plans of them getting that until at least 1975. And that system of beliefs, that doctrine, that concept was accepted as dogma amongst Israeli intelligence. And therefore, no matter what you see, there, there's no war. Based on these principles, in December of 1972, in May of 1973, Amman, the Israeli military intelligence, informed the government that the feasibility of war in the near term was highly unlikely. But Sadat, he could not wait until 1975. He needed to restore Egyptian pride right away. He needed that for domestic reasons. He had to launch the war. And therefore, he had to come up with some solution to Israeli air superiority. And he realized that obtaining parity via conventional means was just not going to happen. So together with the Russians, he came up with a different proposal. They would neutralize the Israeli Air Force in the Suez region by creating one of the densest missile walls in the world. They deployed the SAM-2s, the SAM-3s, the SAM-6 missile batteries, and they would create an umbrella over the Suez region where the Israeli air superiority would have no power. Moreover, to deter Israeli strikes deep into Egypt, the Soviets supplied the Egyptians with Scud surface-to-surface missiles with a range of 180 miles, and the threat was quite well understood by all. You attack us in our heartland, we'll attack you in yours. Israeli armor would be neutralized by a very large concentration of anti-tank weaponry, The Egyptians also work really hard to instill discipline amongst their ranks. During the Six-Day War, the Arab armies led by their politically appointed officers, they were very unorganized, they were unprofessional, they weren't disciplined. When there was the first sight of adversity, they fled. This war was going to be different. No longer are we going to follow the doctrine of political officers, the political officers are going to be replaced with young, with well-trained, competent officers. The Egyptian soldiers engaged in continuous rehearsals almost daily of everything that we need to do on the day of Yom Kippur attack. They're going to be ready and they're going to be well-disciplined. Egypt also studied the Six-Day War on a very deep fundamental level to understand 
how did Israel win so decisively? And then they formulated the strategy accordingly. So they recognized that there's a certain kind of conflict that Israel would excel at. And that is one where A, they seize the initiative, they mount a surprise attack. B, they make large, quick gains and have a very short conflict. And that's, you know, if you have a civilian army, essentially the whole economy has to stop when there's a war. So Israel needed to have a short war to be successful. So Egypt says, okay, if you're going to do like that, this war, we're going to seize the initiative. We're going to mount the surprise attack, and we're going to design it to be a protracted, prolonged battle to wear the Israeli civilian army down to grind them. And Sadat compromised on the Egyptian ambitions to have a total conquest of the lost territory, and he settled for partial conquest of the lost territory. And in fact, the battle plans, they called for crossing, making a large beachhead, and then nothing else. There was no plan what to do next. Just to let's get our foot in the door, make a beachhead on the Israeli side of the of the canal and figure out what to do later. He convinced Syrian President Assad to launch a simultaneous attack in the north, uh, forcing Israel to fight the first two-front war since the War of Independence. Uh, of course, Russia was happy to supply the Syrians with ample anti-aircraft weaponry as well. On the international scene at the UN, the USSR pledged that if things are going well, we're going to forestall a UN-imposed ceasefire. If things were going bad, well, then we're going to demand a ceasefire. They pledged to keep the Egyptians well supplied. In fact, even before the war began, Soviet ships laden with supplies left Soviet ports bound for Egypt. A Soviet airlift was undertaken a few days after the outbreak of the war. King Faisal of Saudi Arabia, he pledged to employ the oil weapon to keep the Americans at bay, to unite all the Arab nations. Sadat has all his puzzle pieces in place for a war the likes of which the Middle East had never seen. Now, he was not shy about his ambitions. Throughout 1973, he engaged in frequent public saber rattling. He gave interviews to whoever would listen to them, and he would widely discuss the upcoming war. Now, he declared that Egypt is prepared to sacrifice a million soldiers to recover its lost territory. And several times, through these pump fakes throughout 1973, the Arab forces, they conduct these large-scale exercises, and that puts the Israelis in high alert. They're expecting a war. They do partial mobilizations. It's a very expensive ordeal for the small Jewish state. And then nothing happens. And that in, in May, in fact, Egypt was planning on going to war, and the Soviets call it off because they have an important summit with the Americans taking place that month in Moscow. They don't want to be disrupted by the war in the Middle East. So what happens after there's a partial mobilization in May? The Israeli intelligence takes the wrong lesson from this unnecessary mobilization. Instead of learning that war was simply being postponed, they argue, well, the concept has been vindicated. No, war is not happening. And that is repeated throughout the establishment. Moshe Dayan, at the time, he's the Israeli defense minister. He says no war with Egypt is imminent. And Egypt also fed this belief with a concerted campaign of misinformation. In fact, they had a whole team dedicated to giving deliberate misinformation to the Israelis. So the Israelis are led to believe that the Egyptian equipment is not well maintained, there's inadequate spare parts, they're undermanned. And Sadat, yes, he is saber-rattling, but he's making these war threats at such a pace that they get muted out by the international community and they're ignored. Eventually, Egypt decides on October 6th on Yom Kippur. It's a day that they assumed correctly that Israeli readiness would be weakest. 
and also the tides in the canal were optimal at the time. And also, quite sinisterly, that month coincided with Ramadan. And the understanding was that the Israelis would least anticipate the Arabs attacking during Ramadan. And indeed, that perception was true as well. In the middle of September, a dogfight occurred between the Israeli and Syrian air forces over the Mediterranean. And that led to 13 Syrian aircraft being shot down with only one Israeli plane being lost. And then what happens immediately afterwards? Syria, they mobilize their troops on the Golan Heights. And what does Israel assume? They're assuming this is interpreted in Israel as being a reaction to that air battle, but not as the beginning of an all-out war. On October 1st, the Egyptian and Syrian forces are put on high alert. Again, the soldiers themselves, they don't know the exact date of the war. They only know that a few hours prior. And these extensive Egyptian exercises on the Suez are something that Israel is so accustomed to seeing that the threat of an invasion is being downplayed. This tremendous buildup of manpower, of weaponry on the Egyptian side They're bringing pontoon bones. They're working feverishly on the ramparts. But Israel assumes that no war was coming. A week before Yom Kippur, King Hussein of Jordan secretly flies to Tel Aviv and he tells Golda Meir, the Israeli prime minister, war is imminent, but he's not believed. An Israeli spy, Ashraf Marwan, who is the son-in-law of the deceased President Nasser, he tells the Israelis that war is happening on Yom Kippur at 6 p.m. He too is not believed. The Egyptians continue their campaign of misinformation. In fact, two days before the war, on Thursday, October 4th, the Egyptian command publicly announced the demobilization of Egyptian troops. And that's, of course, camouflaging the pending war. The indications that war was happening was everywhere. But Israel refused to see it, and the consensus of the intelligence community that war would not be happening, that colored everything. So in the north, the general Yitzhak Khofi, who was the head of the northern command, he reports that the, that the Syrians are preparing for war, and no action is taken. Thursday, October 4th, the Israelis get word that the Soviet diplomatic families are evacuating Egypt doesn't propel the Israelis into action. Eli Zeira, who is the head of the Amman, so his deputy, a guy named Yona Bandman, he is the military intelligence chief for what's happening with Egypt. He filed a report on Friday, October 5th, the day before Yom Kippur, the day before the largest war in Israel's history, he filed the following report. Despite the heightened preparations for war, despite the furious escalation along the Sinai, the possibility for war is low. This is 24 hours before the war. The cabinet, they held multiple weanings on Thursday, on Friday. No action was taken. They said, you know what? Let's meet on Sunday. Let's meet the day after Yom Kippur. Let's reevaluate then. Nevertheless, on Friday, the chief of staff, David Alazar, so he's the head of all the military, he obtained permission to put the army on alert sea, which essentially places the standing army at the highest degree of preparedness and allows for limited mobilization of the reserve army. Parenthetically, it's important to note that after the war, Israel convened the Agronaut Commission to find out how the debacle happened and it pinned much of the blame on Chief of Staff David Lazar, while Dayan and all the rest of the politicians were totally vindicated. And that was quite a dubious conclusion in the eyes of many. By the morning of Yom Kippur, everyone in the Israeli military and political establishment knew that war was imminent. Eli Zaira, the head of Israeli military intelligence, he was awakened at 4 a.m., with reliable information that the Arabs would attack that afternoon. The understanding was it would be at 6 p.m. He calls the chief of the Israeli Air Force, Benny Peled. How long would it take to prepare for a preemptive strike? He says, if you order it now, the strike is ready at 11 a.m. 
10 minutes before 6 a.m., a meeting took place between David Lazar, the head of the army, the chief of staff, and Moshe Dayan, the minister of defense. El Azar wanted to launch a preemptive strike, at least on Syria, and to order a complete mobilization in order to mount an immediate counterattack. Dayan was against both the preemptive strike and wanted only a partial mobilization, only 50,000 for defensive purposes. Now, I have a copy of Moshe Dayan's autobiography, and he spends a significant amount of time trying to justify his decisions, trying to vindicate himself, and arguably whitewash his role in this catastrophic failure. At 8 a.m., another meeting happened in the cabinet. Everyone met together with Golda Meir. Unfortunately, she was someone who did not have any military experience. She just was basing her decisions off the advice of others. She sided with Dayan against a preemptive strike, but she agreed to a mobilization, not of 50,000 like Dayan wanted, but of 100,000 men. In fact, Chief of Staff, David Lazar disobeyed that command and issued a mobilization for many more troops without telling the politicians. Now, why did the Israelis not want to launch a preemptive strike? So there's maybe many factors, but it's important to acknowledge that a big part of the government's decision not to launch a preemptive strike was the threat from the Americans. At that time, Nixon was embroiled in the Watergate scandal. And American policy in the Middle East was handled by the United States Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, a self-hating Jew and someone who felt the need to prove himself to non-Jews. There's a famous quote by him where he told Nixon that, you know, if the Soviets start gassing the Jews, putting them in gas chambers, it's not an American problem. It's a humanitarian problem, not an American problem. A few days into the war, there was a desperate Israeli request for an airlift, and Kissinger said, you know, I kind of hope Israel comes out ahead, but I want it to bleed just enough to soften it for the post-war diplomacy. So Kissinger had warned Israel, don't strike first or else you lose all U.S. support, both military and diplomatic. Now, in his writings... Henry Kissinger claims that he found out about the war only on the morning of Yom Kippur. That's a lie. We know now that the Americans knew for certain that war was imminent. They had intercepted Egyptian phone calls, but in orders of the Nixon administration, they did not pass this information on to the Israelis for a minimum of 30 hours before the war. They knew for sure, and they did not share that information with the Israelis. On Yom Kippur afternoon at 2 p.m., as the Israeli cabinet was monitoring developments on the two fronts, they received notice that war had begun. It began four hours earlier than they anticipated. Ironically, the fact that it was Yom Kippur, all the reservists were either home or in shul or at the synagogue, it made it easier to track them all down. All across the country, soldiers are swapping their prayer shawls, their talisim, for the uniforms, they're rushing to the front. The war that would determine the fate of the Jewish state had begun.